Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for ELPC Thinks. We usually do these in-person briefings in our office where people can interchange and talk together on a face-to-face -face basis. Uh, but we all know that in the current situation of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we need to do things a little bit differently. So thank you for joining us today. Many of you know me, I'm Howard Lerner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental Law and Policy Center. A quick heads up, we'll be recording this webinar and streaming live on Facebook to share it with those who are not able to join us. Today, we'll be talking about the Great Lakes, CAFOs and water quality with Senator Cory Booker and Jeff Reuter. Agricultural runoff pollution of manure from CAFOs and fertilizers from crop fields is contaminating our Great Lakes, especially Lake Erie, causing recurring harmful and toxic algae outbreaks, and that has got to change. ELPC has been in federal court against the Trump EPA to force federal action in the state of Ohio to clean up Lake Erie. Uh, it's time to make a difference on this front. We have a problem in Lake Erie, but across the Midwest and the Great Lakes, we need to solve it when it comes to achieving safe clean water for everyone. Uh, joining us today are U.S. Senator Cory Booker. Uh, we had hoped to have Senator Booker join us in person, but due to Senate business, and I think you know Washington, D.C. is a little hectic right now, Senator Booker is joining us uh, with some recorded remarks on how the Farm System Reform Act can address some of the numerous problems caused by CAFOs, and I think you'll find Senator Booker's presentation uh, to be interesting, important, and provocative. We'll then be joined by Jeff Reuter. Uh, Jeff is a noted expert who's the former director of Ohio State University Stone Lab, excuse me, the Ohio State University Stone Lab, and of the Ohio Sea Grant Program. And Jeff will be discussing Lake Erie toxic algae problems, the phosphorus pollution reductions that we need to do something about it, and how CAFOs are impacting and causing the problems. So let's watch the video, then we'll hear from Jeff and open it up for Q&A. Uh, welcome to United States Senator Cory Booker. Hi everybody, it's Cory Booker and I uh, have a, a statement I wanna read, but before I do that, I just wanna say thank you. I really believe that one of the most pressing issues of our time, threatening our planet, uh, putting an environment that creates the possibilities for future pandemics or antibiotic resistance strains that threaten humanity's health. The challenges we're facing with American workers and small farmers and independent family farmers, the challenges that we see in the treatment of animals, all of these issues and more are in the coming together in the fight that we are fighting against this large corporate industrial sized factory farms. And I am so grateful that you all are having this policy conference today. It is right at the heart, but it's not just a threat on all those issues, threat to our planet, threat to farmers, threat to farm workers, threat to animals, threat to all of humanity with the possible uh, antibiotic resistant diseases. It's also the opportunity. Uh, we are uh, at a point now that we can see that farmers could help lead us out of the climate change problem, um, that their practices could help us to secure the ecology for the future and help us to indeed affirm uh, the proper treatment of workers and affirm uh, animal conditions and many other of the common values we hold in the United States of America and beyond. So I just want to read our remarks, and I'm just so grateful for giving me. I'm doing this all alone today, so um, I'm sorry I can't be with you. Again, I applaud everything that you all are doing. Um, uh, at the heart of our food system right now are these large, broken uh, systems, these factory farms, the runoff from these farms. Uh, poison our waterways, as many of you know, from your work fighting to protect Lake Erie from harmful algae blooms 
and as we see from the massive dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico. And the factory farms are the root of so many of our environmental problems, as I've already discussed. Factory farms account for 37% of methane emissions, which is a greenhouse gas 20 times more powerful than carbon dioxide and global warming. The demand for soybeans and other crops that feed all of the animals jammed into factory farms is the leading driver of deforestation. And manure lagoons on factory farms uh, poisons our air by releasing large amounts of ammonia and other pollutants. Large factory farms are harmful also to just our great rural communities forcing people to live near these massive manure lagoons, making life miserable for neighbors who have their clean air and clean water stolen from them. Large factory farms are also harmful to independent family farmers and ranchers who can be good stewards of the environment but are often unable to compete with industrial meat production. Large factory farms are a grave threat to public health, as I've already mentioned. Scientists and public health professionals are telling us in very clear terms that because of the terrible conditions inside factory farms, their overuse of antibiotics, there is a serious risk that a factory farm will be the source of the next pandemic. And large factory farms cause so much suffering for farm animals with billions of animals each year treated with such immense cruelty that we are all forced to look away rather than to admit that such horror is a daily reality. This is a savagely broken system, a system that simply does not reflect our shared values. I believe the main reason is all of the corporate consolidation going on in America and across our planet. The meat industry today is actually more consolidated than it was 100 years ago when the Congress, when our Congress passed the Packers and Stockyard Act, an antitrust law meant to limit the size and power of big meat packing companies. Large multinational corporations, because of their size and their immense money, have now had undue influence over the meat, meat marketplace and undue influence over our public policy. And they have created this massive industrial meat production system that benefits them and their shareholders, but hurts the rest of us. When I was mayor of Newark, New Jersey, I saw how broken our broken food system was failing local residents. It's not just some Americans, it's failing all Americans. Many of the Americans we know live in food deserts with no access to healthy foods, such as fresh fruits and vegetables. After I was elected to the Senate, I visited Duplin County, North Carolina, where I saw firsthand another broken piece of our food system, how that jagged shard was hurting so many people. There in Duplin, massive factory farms had moved into low-income communities and communities of color and all the misery those factory farms brought to their lives is shameful, shameful. I met with residents there who told me that they felt like prisoners in their own homes, unable to go outside or even open their windows because of the terrible stench from nearby factory farm, which was causing them to suffer respiratory diseases and other health challenges. These residents told me how their drinking water had been ruined by these factory farms. I heard stories about how wells that had been providing clean water to families for generations had been contaminated by cancer-causing pollutants. So what do we do now? What do people of compassion and empathy who feel that we should be a nation of justice for all, what do we do? How do we take on this massive system and transform it into something that is aligned with our values? I think we have the answer. And I think that is us uniting in our cause. We have to unite all the different people and different groups that are injured by this horrible factory farming system and who oppose factory farms. And that is what I am working to do. Last year, I brought together advocates, animal welfare uh, groups, clean water advocates, progressive farmers and ranchers, public health professionals. We all drafted a bill called the Farm System Reform Act. 
This bill would strengthen the Packers and Stockyard Act, providing more bargaining power for family, farmers, and ranchers. This bill would also hold big meat packing companies responsible for the harm that factory farms cause and would not allow them to continue to externalize the costs of all the damage they are causing to public health and our environment. Reforming our food system and ending factory farming will not be easy. It is challenging. As Frederick Douglass says, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. This will be a struggle. Those with the most to lose have deep influence on both sides of the political aisles in the halls of Congress. They have immense amount of money and that money they use to pow for power and influence. But our country is at a turning point, and I believe we have a moral obligation to do better and build a better food system that reflects our common values. And I am hopeful. I believe that together we can fix our broken food system. I'll say it again. I believe that together we can fix our broken food system. That means we need to phase out big factory farms, which as you know, would have a transformative impact on the Great Lakes and on water quality all around our country. Together, we can create a better future. I believe together that we can make for justice. I know and I'm proud to work with all of you to make it happen. I know that we feel the same common conviction, the same common cause. May our work continue, may the struggle go on, and may we find a way to make our nation's food systems reflect the best of our values. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cory Booker, for that inspiring talk. It was important, it was focused, it explained the source of the problem, and identifies much of what we need to do. I know there are gonna be a lot of questions and comments. Uh, cue those up please in the chat, in the Q&A function, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Uh, with that, let me pass the microphone over to Jeff Reuter, who I introduced before, uh, distinguished professor from the Ohio State University, head of the Ohio Sea Grant Program, and expert on Lake Erie pollution. Thank you, Jeff Reuter, for joining us. Thank you, Howard. Uh, I'm in the process of pulling stuff up. Tell me if you're able to uh, see the presentation. Excellent. All right, thank you much, Howard, for uh, uh, the opportunity to speak here. I'm gonna start off and make sure and or sort of explain the role of phosphorus, nitrogen, fertilizer, manure, um, and CAFOs in harmful algal blooms. Uh, let's begin by thinking about the NPK ratio and making sure we understand the concept of a limiting nutrient, where N here equals nitrogen, P is phosphorus, and K is potassium. So if you went into a, a, a Home Depot or a Lowe's and got a bag of fertilizer, you'd see on the back the, the NPK ratio. And, and here you see the, uh, yeah, let me see change my screen here a little bit, you'll see an example from a, a bag of uh, uh, Scott's Lawn Care Fertilizer 3309, meaning that zero there in the middle is the phosphorus number. I put this one in in particular because starting with January 1st, 2013, Scott's removed phosphorus from all its lawn care, lawn care products except for its starter fertilizer. I think we all understand that fertilizer makes plants. That's the combination of grass, crops, algae. It makes them grow. And the nutrients for those plants can come in the form of bags of fertilizer or animal manure. Uh, as plants grow, as the algae grow, it uses the nutrients. The essential nutrient, this is a nutrient that's got to be there. The essential nutrient that runs out first or the one that's used up first is called the limiting nutrient. When that nutrient is gone, the growth of the algae stops or the plant stops. In fresh water, the limiting nutrient is usually phosphorus. In salt water, it's usually nitrogen. Therefore, when we're looking at a harmful algal bloom or a bloom of algae in fresh water, it's usually the amount of phosphorus that determines how big that bloom is going to get. Hold on a second. 
when we look at uh, the different forms of algae, we are think primarily about three different forms. In cold weather, we see diatoms. So during the winter, diatoms. In the spring and the fall, we see greens. And notice both the diatoms and the green algae, you see the yellow in there, that's lipid or fat. These are nutrient rich. They're great for the food chain. The, the zooplankton that eats the algae uh, would do very well eating the diatoms and the green. In the summer, when the water is very warm, when nutrient concentrations are high, we get blue-green algae, or more accurately, cyanobacteria. They don't contain much fat. They're not, there's not many things that eat them, and they're not a, a good component for the food chain. Too much phosphorus, limiting nutrient here, too much phosphorus causes the harmful algal blooms, or HABs, and dead zones. Dead zones are areas in a lake or a stream, usually at the bottom below the thermocline where the dissolved oxygen is two milligrams per liter or less. Harmful algal blooms are large masses of algae, again, primarily blue-green algae or cyanobacteria and freshwater. They require or they do best typically in warm water and where hot concentrations of phosphorus are high. They're capable of producing toxins and those toxins are about 14% nitrogen by weight. So phosphorus will determine the size of the bloom, but nitrogen may determine how toxic that bloom will be. What I've attempted to do here is show you the four primary algal toxins in red. On this list, the most toxic things are at the top, the least toxic things are at the bottom. You see number two on the list, microcystin LR. That's the one that caused the Toledo water crisis. The number third, or number three there is saxitoxin. Uh, that's a terrorism agent. And you'll also notice that the four primary algal toxins are all, all more toxic than cyanide that you see here where my cursor is down about two thirds or three quarters of the way down the page. We think about problems caused by harmful algal blooms. We see environmental problems, economic problems, and human, human and animal health problems. From an environmental st standpoint, we've got a single species that's really of not much value to the food chain, and it contributes to the oxygen depletion causing dead zones. On the economic side, we see a great increase in our water treatment costs, we see a reduction in tourism, and we see hundreds of millions of dollars of property value losses. On the human health and animal health side, we see dog and livestock deaths. We saw the loss of drinking water. For example, 500,000 people in Toledo, Ohio in August 2014. Uh, from a human health standpoint, problems caused by the toxins, we see neurological problems, rashes, breathing problems, kidney and liver problems, intestinal problems. We see an increased incidence of non-alcoholic liver cancer wherever HABs occur. And there's early evidence of links to ALS, Parkinson's, and Alzheimer's. And with the neurological problems, that makes a lot of sense. And we see the airborne effects of harmful algal blooms extending over a mile inland. These issues are not new to the Great Lakes, particularly Lake Erie was sort of the poster child of this back in the late 60s and the 1970s. On the left, you see my hand in front of OSU's Stone Laboratory up at Putin Bay in, in 1971. On the right, you see my hand at the same location in 2013. Back in the 70s, we solved this problem when we identified phosphorus as a limiting nutrient. US EPA was created in 1970. We passed the Clean Water Act and the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement in 1972, and that gave us the ability to regulate and, mit and reduce the flow of phosphorus from sewage treatment plants. And in those days, two thirds or about 70% of the phosphorus was coming from poor sewage treatment. So when we improved sewage treatment, the blooms went away, the lake became the walleye capital of the world and one of the best examples in the world of ecosystem recovery. In the late 1990s, the amount of phosphorus started going back up and where it is there in 2013 is back where we were in the 1970s and sometimes a little higher. This problem is, as uh, Senator Booker has indicated, it's not a, a a Great Lakes problem or a Midwest problem. It's not really even a U.S. or a, a, a problem here in the United States, but it is covering the whole country. We're seeing harmful algal blooms now in all 50 states. Over 40% of all the lakes and the ponds in the U.S. have too much phosphorus, over 35%. 
have too much nitrogen. Microcystin, the toxin that caused the Toledo water crisis, is detected in 39% of all the lakes and ponds. The problem's getting worse. Ohio EPA has found saxitoxin, the terrorism agent, in over 25% of all of Ohio's drinking water sources. And Lake Erie, for example, has all four of the primary allotoxins. What I've attempted to do here, this is a, a slide from the Annex 4 uh, Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, our report. I was the U.S. chair of the team of scientists that came up with our targets. What we did right here, the, the pink or the magenta color shows the 90 largest tributary loaders of phosphorus to the Great Lakes. The green bars represent the connecting channels. So for instance, we think of the Detroit River as a connecting channel uh, and the Niagara River as a connecting channel between lakes rather than as tributaries to the lakes. The largest tributary to the Great Lakes is the Maumee River. It drains the largest watershed to the Great Lakes at, at Toledo, and four million acres of that watershed is agriculture. Uh, in 20 or 2008, we used that as our base year for our work with Annex 4, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. We estimated that the Detroit River, which brings in 80 to 90% of the flow to Lake Erie, was contributing a little over 2,000 tons of phosphorus. The Maumee River, which brings in 3 to 4% of the flow to Lake Erie, was bringing in 3,800 tons, again, draining 4 million acres of agricultural land. The next largest loader was the uh, Sandusky River uh, draining one and a half million acres of agriculture land. And then when we think about the problems we see around the Great Lakes, at least some common ones on harmful algal blooms, Saginaw Bay, you see a large load of phosphorus coming in. Green Bay, you see a large load of phosphorus coming in. And we see on the Canadian side, they have the same issue where the Thames and the Sydenham come into Lake St. Clair. Looking at the Maumee River, we see that 70 to 90% of that giant 3,800 ton phosphorus load comes in during the 10 largest storm events each year. Climate change is therefore gonna make this worse as we get more frequent severe storms. We also can see that agricultural runoff accounts for more than 85% of that phosphorus load from the Maumee River. And that's what drives harmful algal blooms on Lake Erie. We know that it's not the lawn care uh, fertilizer because Scotts has removed it and 95% of the market followed suit. It's not failing septic tanks, about 4%. It's not combined sewer overflows, about 1%. And it's not internal loading from our past uh, sins, let's say, putting in phosphorus in past years. That, that contributes about three to 7%. We started seeing these blooms come back in the mid to late 1990s, and we've monitored them from satellites uh, since 2002. On these charts showing the blooms from each of the years from 2002 to 2017, the red areas show where the concentration of cyanobacteria is very, very high. The black areas show where it's zero. Now back to the Toledo water crisis and, and allowable amounts of this toxin. Now remember that microcystin LR is extremely toxic, much more toxic than cyanide. So to have an amount in our drinking water that we would consider safe, it has to be a very small amount. World Health Organization rep recommends not more than one part per billion. US EPA for adult recommends not more than 1.6 parts per billion, and for children, 0.3 parts per billion. These red areas here in the scum, and many of these blue-green algae or cyanobacteria are floaters, not all of them, but when it's calm, most of them will come to the surface, form a scum, and float. When you sample in that scum, the concentration of the toxin that you see is commonly or often in the range of about 10,000 parts per billion. So to address this, we're recommending a 40% reduction. This is not a new number. The Ohio Phosphorus Task Force recommended that 40% reduction in March 2013. The International Joint Commission also recommended the 40% reduction in October 2013. 
the Objectives and Targets Task Team of Annex 4 of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, about 25 scientists from the US and Canada in May 2015 came out with much more extensive recommendations, uh, recognizing that we really needed to reduce the spring loading of phosphorus. It has to be more than just total phosphorus, but also dissolved phosphorus, and it's the dissolved phosphorus that's really driving this problem but it, re it recommended a 40% reduction, and it recommended that we trace our progress using the flow-weighted mean concentration of, the, uh, uh, of phosphorus, both for total phosphorus and dissolved phosphorus from the fields, and US and Canada agreed with those recommendations in February 2016. Give you an idea of what a 40% reduction would do. If you look at the bloom here from 2011, a 40% reduction on that bloom would make it look like the bloom from 2008. A 40% reduction on the bloom from 2008 <clears throat> would make it look like the bloom from 2012. And a 40% reduction on the bloom from 2012 would make it just about go away. So it gives you an idea that that 40% reduction is not going to totally eliminate these blooms, but it's going to greatly reduce the blooms. On Lake Erie, for example, and many other places around the country, I like to say we're in the middle of the third battle of Lake Erie. We fought the first of the Battle of the War of 1812. Oliver Hazard Perry defeated the British. Other famous quotation, we have met the enemy and they are ours. We fought that one with tall ships. We fought the second battle in, 19, in the 1970s, and we fought that by improving sewage treatment. So we fought that battle with sewage treatment plants. And again, the lake responded, became the walleye capital of the world and a huge driver for the economy. The third battle of Lake Erie we're fighting right now, and we need to fight this battle with uh, improved agricultural practices. The recommended best management practices from the SARA 17 conference on phosphorus, uh, the first most important one is to use the right amount of uh, fertilizer when you apply it. Don't apply too much. When you apply it, don't lay it on the surface, but insert it three to five inches when you apply it. The third one would be to control erosion. There are several ways, filter strips, grass waterways, blind inlets, et cetera. And the fourth one would be to minimize the amount of water leaving a field. And you can do that by improving soil health, getting more carbon into the soil, constructing wetlands. But again, the most important one, and when you really think about sustainable agriculture, sustainable agriculture should be only apply what is needed for crop production. Don't apply too much fertilizer or manure. When we look at manure and, and fertilizer, compare those commercial fertilizer and manure, we see that the first, the phosphorus runoff concentration from a field is directly related to the soil test phosphorus. The more phosphorus is on, that is on that field, the, more, the, more, the higher the concentration or the more phosphorus can run off when you get a storm. It's also important to note that there's nothing inherently wrong with manure. When commercial fertilizer and manure are applied in the same amounts, they uh, are equally good or equally bad. The problem that we have with manure is that the current guidelines allow about four times the amount of phosphorus, uh, that, or more than four times the amount of phosphorus that's needed for maximum crop production. So really what we're doing the, with the manure, and this is particularly true of the large animal operations, is we're looking at waste disposal. We shouldn't think of it as fertilizer because we're putting on way too much. The worst legacy fields, and these are fields that have way too much phosphorus, are around animal operations. And when I say worst legacy fields, these are fields that have 20 to 40 times more phosphorus than is needed for maximum crop production. It's highly likely to find legacy fields wherever manure has been applied. And when we think about the CAFOs and the guidelines that they have right now, recognizing that those guidelines allow them to apply four times, more than four times too much, these are very large operations. For example, typically more than 700 dairy cows, more than 2,500 hogs, more than one and a quarter million chickens. So they're big, big, big operations. And there's a, a I'm, I'm hearing about a, a dairy operation in China right now that would have 100,000 dairy cows. Unregulated CAFOs just below the sizes that I listed above there, they're growing more rapidly than the regulated ones. 
and they even though our current guidelines are, are allow too much to be applied, the unregulated CAFOs can put on anything that they want. Uh, if we look at the period from 2005 to 2018 in the Maumee River, we saw more than a 40% increase in the number of CAFOs and the number of animals increased from 9 million to 20 million animals in, in the watershed. Look at policy opportunities and challenges, things to think about as we move forward, how might we work on this? One of the obvious things is that over half the farmed land is rented. Uh, about 40% of the corn goes to ethanol production and about 40% goes to animal feed. The solutions that we come up with, they have to be independent of commodity prices. They have to work if whether corn is two or seven dollars per bushel. We talk about the size of farms greatly growing and expanding. Well, 55% of the farms are 50 acres or less but they represent only 3% of the farmed land. So clearly our farms, farms are growing in size. We need incentive and disincentive programs with more than just carrots. We have to have some sticks in there if we're gonna make these work. Voluntary approaches have not worked. Sustainable agriculture should begin with not applying too much phosphorus and nitrogen. The current regulations now allow manure to be applied at four times the amount that's needed. This is creating legacy fields and making the problem worse right now. Until we have solutions for what we're gonna do moving forward, I would support the legislation that Senator Booker has proposed that's calling for a moratorium on new CAFOs. Uh, we should think about reducing the size of regulated farms, bringing more of those small farms that are growing more rapidly than the number of CAFOs, bringing more of those small ones into the regulated arena. And the work that Environmental Law and Policy Center has been doing on using remote sensing to, set sensing to estimate the number of animals and animal operations, I think that's wonderful. I don't think we're gonna get those numbers without that because it hasn't been coming from agriculture. Suggested readings, a real recent report from a publication in biogeochemistry from Patricia, Patricia Gilbert at uh, University of Maryland. This is excellent, this first one. Uh, there is so much information in that, in that publication. I encourage you to look at it. There's commentary on phosphorus in the Journal of Great Lakes Research. Uh, the lead author on that was Robin Wilson. I was one of the co-authors. This eerie past, present, and future is an article I wrote for the Encyclopedia of Water. And how climate change affects harmful algal blooms is a white paper uh, Bill Stanley and I wrote from, uh, for the Nature Conservancy. And with that, Howard, I'll turn this back to you stop sharing and take some questions. Thank you very much, Jeff. I know people have a lot of questions and comments and I'd like to make sure that everybody has a chance. We've been trying to answer some of the questions uh, in real time in terms of uh, CAFOs, uh, for those who don't know, concentrated animal feeding or feedlot operations. Uh, C-A-F-O, if you will, S, CAFOs. And uh, I've posted some information on Senator Booker's legislation where you can find out more about it uh, and some of the co-sponsors of the bills. All right, so let's see if we can go to some of the Q&A here. And Jeff, thank you for joining us uh, for your excellent presentation and really for the very good work you're doing. Um, a question from Beth Drucker. Uh, how does remote sensing work to determine how many animals are in a CAFO? Um, can you talk a little bit about the use of satellites and drones? Um, we could answer some of that e ELPC, but I know you've thought about a lot about that too. Yeah, let me first start with the way we would uh, use satellites to determine size of blooms, because that was one of the first uses and incredibly important to us with our work and coming up, coming up with targets and measuring these blooms. We're really fortunate that the cyanobacteria or the blue-green algae that produce a pigment that none of the other algae produce, phycocyanin. That means that from the satellites, we can look for that pigment, and based on the amount of pigment we see, we can determine how big that bloom is. 
This was work that was done back in the late 1990s by uh, Rick Stump. I was involved with it. And what uh, Rick Stump from uh, NOAA, uh, what, what, what Rick or Dr. Stump was doing was, was using his satellite and picking out spots on Lake Erie where, where he saw a high concentration of that particular pigment. And then we would run out from Stone Lab and grab a sample in that location and tell them what we were seeing. And in the process, we were able to calibrate the satellites. Uh, Howard, I probably should let you talk about the work that you guys are doing on uh, the animal operations. Sure. One of the things that the Environmental Law and Policy Center has done is look to the use of satellites to be able to monitor from above where there are CAFOs. Uh, in Ohio, if a CAFO has less than 2,500 animals, it's not subject to the permitting process. And as a number of our colleagues have pointed out, these are in effect hidden CAFOs. But through satellite monitoring, you can tell where there's a large collection of buildings that house animals. Um, our researcher, Lucas Stevens, has been able to then use industry data for the number of animals likely to be in each of the buildings. You can use USDA data then to calculate the amount of manure that's being produced by those animals. Uh, that's on the Environmental Law, Law and Policy Center's website. Uh, take a look at CAFO monitoring on ELPC's website. Uh, sneak preview. We're going to be doing more of that uh, in Wisconsin as well as Ohio. And ELPC is going to be working with some experts at Stanford University to really up our game in terms of being able to do that sort of remote monitoring to be able to tell how much manure is occurring from which CAFOs in what places. Let's see if we might move to another question um, from Annie Morse, Jeff. Uh, to what degree does urban sewer runoff contribute to the problem? You know, in Lake Erie, I understand the point that 90 to 95% is coming from agricultural runoff, mostly fertilizers from crop fields and manure from CAFOs. How about in cities like, you know, Chicago and Milwaukee and so forth? Well, it, Chicago is an interesting case because you, you send it away from the Great Lakes, but the, 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 the situation, um, it, it's a huge improvement that we saw with the creation of the Clean Water Act, which really allowed us to uh, put secondary sewage treatment in, uh, reduce the amount of uh, phosphorus uh, that is coming in, or all nutrients really, reduce the amount of nutrients coming in and improve our water quality tremendously. The, uh, uh, when, when a key thing to keep in mind, we see this on all of our, our <coughs> rivers, when we're combining uh, a load, say, from the Cuyahoga River at Cleveland, which is heavily urban tributary, uh, and the Maumee River at Toledo, when we get an extreme rain event at Toledo, the concentration of phosphorus in the Maumee River increases. You get a lot of rain on that agricultural land. It washes the uh, fertilizer and manure off into the river and the concentration goes up. In Cleveland, when you get a big rain event, the volume of water goes up just like it does on the Maumee, but the concentration of nutrients in that water goes down because it's diluted by the runoff off of streets and sidewalks and roofs and all those kinds of things. Hope that helps. But it, I'm, I'm not saying that the, uh, uh, clearly we want to eliminate combined sewer overflows, uh, but the, uh, uh, in most places around the country, uh, concentrations from cities is much smaller than concentrations from agricultural runoff. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, questions from a couple of people, Terry Lowinger, uh, Dana Textoris, and others about who's supporting Senator Booker's legislation and who's not, you know, for example, Ohio legislators. Um, I'm gonna ask, our federal legislative director, Ann Mesnikoff, 
uh, to put together an email both on the legislation and letting people know who's supporting and who's not so that people can follow up. Uh, we will send out an email to the people who are at this meeting with that. Uh, I don't have the full list of who's on, who's not, uh, although I've, with regard to some of the co-sponsors, uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren in the Senate, uh, Representative Ro Canna uh, in the House is sponsoring companion legislation. There's some more detail on that that I sent a quick note out to people on the chat room. Uh, but we'll follow up and uh, I'll ask Ann Mesnikoff to put that together. I'm really glad uh, to hear yeah. that, Howard, because at, at, in reality, I, I don't think we bring these harmful algal blooms and dead zones under control if we aren't in some way able to modify our practices with large animal operations. If we keep doing what we're doing now, it's just going to get worse. Great. Uh, Jeff, you might want to comment. There are a number of questions here from Cindy Carter, from Laurie Horwick, uh, to some degree from Matthew Pierce, asking about why isn't there not stricter regulations on smaller CAFOs? Uh, is that something you can comment on? Well, I mean, honestly, I uh, when you say they're not stricter regulations, there really aren't any regulations on the smaller ones. Once you get under that regulated size, they can do just about anything that they want. So one suggestion would be to greatly reduce the regulated size. So, you know, for the large CAFOs that we need to have better regulations, for the small ones, we need to bring them into the regulated group and, you know, do you know anyone that, you know, is going to stand and raise their hand and say, I would like to be regulated? I don't think they're, you're not going to find those people. And that's why they're not regulated. It's a very powerful industry. Uh, Jeff, um, there are a couple of questions about, uh, from our good friend, Tom Henry at the Toledo Blade and from others about your sense of is the state of Ohio likely to create legislation to increase regulation of CAFOs? How do you see that playing out in Ohio? That's a really good question because right now I think uh, Governor DeWine is really trying to do the right thing. Uh, the big challenge though, you have a Republican governor we're talking about the very rural portions of Ohio. That's where these operations are concerned. And that's, you know, the Republican stronghold. It's hard to do that from a political standpoint. That's, that's a tough thing to do. But we're not going to solve the problem unless we do it. Uh, a couple of years ago, he created a program in Ohio called H2 Ohio that is doing some really good things. Um, with creation of wetlands uh, through Ohio Department of Natural Resources. Uh, I like the idea of wetlands. I'm, I work with Nature Conservancy and, 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 and that creates sort of long-term solutions. Um, I don't see uh, paying for cover crops as being a smart way of doing this uh, as simply an incentive unless we couple it with some kind of a disincentive uh, to penalize people if they're not doing the things that they should be doing. So uh, I'm, I do think Governor Wine's trying to do the right thing. Uh, I see through the H2 Ohio initiative an effort to push hard in that direction. Whether he's gonna be able to accomplish it, I'm not sure, it'll be hard. There are a number of questions, uh, Jeff, about why isn't the US EPA and the Clean Water Act helping us now and the sufficiency of the H2O program? Um, I can take a little bit of a whack at that. You might want to add some comments, Jeff. Uh, that's the very focus of the Environmental Law and Policy Center's lawsuit in the US District Court for the Northern District of Ohio. Um, our contention, and so far uh, the federal district court judge has ruled in our favor, is that the US EPA hasn't done enough. And under the Clean Water Act, uh, the US EPA and by implication, the state of Ohio have to step, step up and reduce agricultural runoff pollution in order to mitigate and alleviate toxic algae outbreaks in Western Lake Erie. We're looking forward to a decision we expect soon from the federal district court. Uh, the court uh, denied the US EPA's motion to dismiss our case under the Clean Water Act. 
and the court is likely to rule on cross motions for summary judgment fairly soon. So fingers crossed, uh, I don't get into the business of uh, predicting outcomes of court decisions. Uh, we believe strongly that our position is legally correct, good policy, an important action to help solve the problem, toxic algae outbreaks in Western Lake Erie. Uh, there are a number of questions, Jeff, or people just, if you will, pointing out that the impact is not just um, on algae, uh, but the impact of nutrient runoff uh, leading to E. coli uh, and other problems in water. Um, for example, in Western Lake, in Southwest Wisconsin's driftless area, the, the testing sample of uh, private drinking water wells found that 42% were contaminated uh, by agricultural runoff pollution. Uh, and most of the problem there is E. coli. Um, some questions, Jeff, about do inland lakes have similar problems with algae blooms? Uh, Margaret Sadoff uh, and some other people asked that question. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, they do. Uh, uh, in fact, now every state in the country has issues with harmful algal blooms. Uh, and back to that US EPA report, uh, uh, we're looking at essentially over 40% now of the lakes and ponds in the country have microcystin, the toxin in it. 40% uh, have too much phosphorus. So yeah, this is in, in Ohio, we have over uh, 20 um, lakes uh, that have significant problems with these. Uh, Grand Lake St. Mary's is maybe, maybe the worst, but problems at Buckeye Lake and other places, very, very common. A uh, number of years ago, I was interacting a lot with people from Texas and Oklahoma that were struggling with this issue. Uh, Lake Okeechobee in uh, Florida is one of the spots where uh, uh, the work of uh, Jung Lee uh, from OSU was looking at uh, the uh, non-alcoholic liver cancer. And so we see increased rates of non-alcoholic liver cancer around Lake Okeechobee and, and in Toledo, Ohio, for instance. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's very, very, unfortunately, very common around the country. I'm looking, Jeff, to questions people have about um, regenerative agriculture, uh, ways of uh, different uh, food for animals, how that might make a difference? Well, it actually already has made a big difference. Uh, uh, for instance, um, we are seeing a good example. The numbers that came from uh, uh, the Environmental Law and Policy Center and, and Environmental Working Group report this great increase in the number of halves in the Maumee River and great increase in the number of animals. And the uh, number of animals more than doubled. The, the amount of manure that was generated went up by maybe 30%. Uh, so it wasn't a doubling, it was much worse than it was before. So what we're, what we're seeing is improved a lot of research to improve the quality of the feed that the animals are eating so that they get more nourishment and are excreting less, quote, manure. Uh, so we're seeing less waste, more growth. That's good for farming and it's good for the environment. Jeff, I think I've gone through at least most, if not all of the questions. I've pulled a number of them together. Um, any um, additional comments you have, uh, you know, just wrap it up a little bit in terms of your thinking. Um, and at one point that a couple people are asking, um, our board chair, Harry Drucker, who you know, and others, you know, are there some sort of bioremediation options that are available to reduce legacy phosphorus that's already present in fields? What's the state of technology in terms of anaerobic digesters and other things to um, deal with manure? Uh, those are, are great questions. And in many ways, um, see, I don't see we're going to come. I don't. We're 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 not going to solve this voluntarily. Uh, we have never solved uh, 
we, we can't show any place around the country where we've improved things, um, Chesapeake Bay, any other place around the country where it's happened voluntarily. We've had to go at it with regulations uh, or really strong incentives and the best incentive programs are coupled with strong disincentive programs. But I'm also a strong believer that regulation drives innovation. Um, and if the kinds of things that Harry was talking about with uh, better digesters or, or is there some um, uh, new uh, uh, material that we could put on the soil that would bind and hold on to that phosphorus, uh, we're more likely to find that stuff if we have stricter regulations to protect the environment. And I tried to emphasize also in the beginning that this is not just an environmental issue. I often see this referred to as an environmental problem, but we're talking about serious, very serious human health issues and very serious economic consequences. Um, when Lake Erie went from being the poster child for pollution problems to the walleye capital of the world, there's 88 counties in Ohio. The eight counties that border Lake Erie have now about 30 to 40 percent of the tourism. It's valued at over 14 billion dollars per year with 125 or 126 thousand jobs associated with that just on the tourism side. Uh, and then the things that we're seeing on, on impacts on liver cancer, and and when you when you think about dealing with neurotoxins, why should we be surprised that there's a link between ALS and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and things like that? Um, so it, we really need to take this more seriously. There's a a quote. Uh, in that biogeochemistry paper that I referred to, uh, it said farmers have long been considered inherently good stewards of the land. And it goes on and on. And then it goes, the notion of this good stewardship contrasts with current reality and thus, rather than reach a middle ground that balanced agriculture and environmental conservation policymakers large policymakers largely yielded to agricultural exceptionalism. Nearly every major federal environmental statute passed since 1970 has included carve-outs for farms. We see that all the time. When you, when you think about going, uh, if I would drove from Toledo to Fort Wayne, Indiana, and I would see giant farms along the way, and I'd see pipes, the tiles, drain tiles coming out, uh, on the side of a field into the ditch, and I can see water coming out of that pipe. And I know that that's the problem. It's water coming right out of that pipe. And that we used to define point source pollution as, yeah, it's coming right out of that pipe. But in agriculture, that's been carved out and that's not point source pollution. That kind of thing makes it very challenging to deal with this and the fact that for so many years, all of us had this warm, fuzzy spot for farmers and agriculture. And it's really important that we don't paint, you know, all farmers as being bad here because there's not. The vast majority of the farmers that I work with are trying to do the right thing, uh, but there are some out there that just are not. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, before signing off, I'm just going to try to answer a couple of quick questions from some good friends and colleagues of the LPC. Uh, Liz Kirkwood, and shout out to Liz for her work on the Enbridge Line 5 pipeline over the last five, six years and the big success we had last week. Liz Kirkwood and uh, Taylor Robertson and a couple of others asked uh, what can be done you know, in court for transformative policy solutions. Uh, the Environmental Law and Policy Center and Advocates for a Clean Lake Erie's federal court lawsuit is potentially pathbreaking. Uh, we prevailed in opposing the US EPA and the US Department of Justice's motion to dismiss, and we prevailed in a preceding case. Um, my colleague, Rob Michaels, and I had oral argument in August on cross motions for summary judgment. 
Uh, we are joined as co-plaintiffs uh, with Lucas County, which surrounds Toledo. Uh, the cities of Toledo and Oregon have filed amicus briefs. Uh, we're awaiting the district court's decision. We expect that decision to come out before the end of the year. Um, Amy Buska and some others asked, uh, when are we going to get to Iowa to do remote sensing? Um, no discrimination against our good friends in Iowa and Hawkeyes. It's a big deal undertaking. We started in Ohio. We are now going to be going to Wisconsin. And Amy, we will get to Iowa. We need to make sure we get our new approach, the new improved approach working well in Wisconsin. And then we do plan to roll that out in other states as well. All right. Thank you to everybody who was able to join us today. I hope you found this interesting as well as important. Uh, thank you to U.S. Senator Cory Booker, uh, both for joining us and for all that he's doing uh, legislatively and for his passion and engagement. And thank you very much to uh, Dr. Jeff Reuter, a leading expert on the issues here and someone who has worked for years to try to deal with the problems of how do we alleviate recurring toxic algae outbreaks in Western Lake Erie. Thank you for joining us. Let's get some things done. Let's make a difference.